The Ryzen 7 7700 from AMD, the non-X variant, is now my new favorite Ryzen 7000 series CPU. And in today's review, I am going to be breaking it down and explaining exactly why this is. We're in the benchmarks here today. We've tested this CPU with both 6,000 megahertz memory on a more expensive outfit with a water cooler and also a more expensive motherboard. But then we've also tested it with the included Wraith Prism Box Cooler 4800 megahertz memory on a budget B650 motherboard. This is the Riptide from ASRock, which comes in at roughly $150, so still commands a bit of a premium. But when we look at that 4800 megahertz 32 gigabyte DDR5, that's come down a lot in price, as well as the CPU itself with the included cooler is coming in, in my opinion, at an extremely good price considering the performance. And then the icing on the cake with this CPU is simply how it is tuned out of the box where we saw those 7950Xs and other CPUs that were initially released coming with a profile out of the box that was hitting 95 degrees. And this was way too hot for my liking because the inefficiency was really creeping up. And for instance, the 7950X was hitting 230 watts out of the box. This CPU, even with the Wraith Prism, is only hitting 90 watts. And it's doing so getting in the realm of 4.8 to 4.9 gigahertz all cores and the single core still boosts to over 5.3 gigahertz. However, let's go over all the gaming and productivity benchmarks and then give you guys a recommendation with this CPU. Today's video is brought to you by Atlas VPN, the most affordable, easiest to use and safest VPN on the market. And for just $1.99 per month, you can browse completely private However, the benefits of a VPN are so important. It's not just for protecting your data from snoopy ISPs and companies and browsing search engines without tracking your activity. It also unlocks features that are extremely useful. For instance, my favorite anime Bleach on Netflix is only available in Japan and I can't watch it in Australia. However, if I use Atlas VPN, I can now pretend I am in Japan. I can watch this series in Australia hassle free. It also works on multiple devices and there is unlimited uses for all your devices. So have a private new year and all of 2023 with Atlas VPN Premium. You can have it for just $1.99 per month and get six months for free with a 30 day money back guarantee. Clicking the link in the video description or pinned comment down below. So today's test setup, we'll be using an RTX 4090, which is essentially the best graphics card you can get. We're testing max settings at three different resolutions, 1080p, 1440p, and also 4K. As we said before, across those two different setups, one being a budget orientated setup, and we did leave on above 4G decoding, essentially allowing the GPU in certain scenarios to take a bit of the load off the CPU side of things. However, the first title we're pulling up here is Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, and here is where with that RTX RTX 4090 on the lower settings, just to stress the CPU, we are getting pretty high up there in the charts, even with 4,800 megahertz memory. So I was actually shocked to see with this above 4G decoding setting on that the difference between 6,000 megahertz Expo and 4,800 megahertz banger budget memory was really not worth the price differential on these two setups. And also coming in versus the other CPUs in this benchmark, it's performing extremely well. And here is the second benchmark that we'll throw up is the power efficiency in this game, which versus the FPS that you're getting, it's one of the top efficient CPUs out of the box. Now you can undervolt this if you want to, essentially shaving off a little bit of wattage and a tiny bit of performance, but it's also really good out of the box, which is what I like to see, especially for people getting into PC gaming or people who just don't want any hassles. Then going up to 1440p and 4K, those differences versus 1080p were even further mitigated. So even going with the RTX 4090 on this budget setup here, you're really not going to be leaving a whole lot of performance on the table. And further showing this is Horizon Zero Dawn, where here's where we got some near chart topping numbers with the 7700, even with that 4800 megahertz memory. So this was another impressive result across 1080p lower settings, then 1440p max settings, as well as 4K max settings. However, I will interlude here and say that I have disabled core isolation, both on the Intel and the AMD systems, as I believe this is a setting, especially if you're using Windows 11, that's enabled by default and it can affect your FPS, which is why I think a lot of people prefer to stay on Windows 10 with AMD systems 
as opposed to going to Windows 11 where they turn the setting on by default. But in all scenarios, I would recommend turning the setting off for a boost on FPS, both on Intel and AMD. And then moving over to Cyberpunk 2077 here, here's where at 1080p, the difference between that 4,800 megahertz and also that 6,000 megahertz was very minimal and going over to 1440p and also 4K, showed not much of a difference here either. Then going on to CSGO, the 7700 is getting some really good performance near chart topping performance on both memory configurations. In fact, there was very minimal difference here between these two memory settings. I was actually really shocked to see this and I was scratching my head because when I've seen other DDR5 memory comparisons on Ryzen 7000, I've seen bigger differences, but testing it here, especially with above 4G decoding, shows that there's a very different picture to be painted. So thank you to those guys that recommended I test with the more budget orientated memory, at least with Ryzen 7000, it's not much of a difference to be had here. And in fact, the performance is great, especially if you leave the above 4G decoding enabled. So the gaming benchmarks show, if we look at an average FPS per dollar across 1080p, 1440p and 4K, this is actually a really good value CPU if you are going with high-end gaming graphics cards and you wanna push more money away from the CPU, motherboard and RAM, for example, and put it towards the GPU. The 7700 is gonna be an excellent option for that, coupled in with the fact that it's also going to be low power consumption in general across the board. So you can even go, for instance, instead of getting a thousand watt power supply, you can go with an RTX 4090 and an 850 watt power supply and save some money there too. Though before we get into that recommendation, let's get these productivity numbers out of the way because the gaming is only half the picture. And here is where the first benchmark, Cinebench, this is where the numbers were looking pretty good, but the 13600K is still pulling out quite a sizable victory here, but I will add the 13600K is doing so at actually using quite a bit more power. So that in turn will need a better cooling solution that doesn't come with a box cooler. And also when we look at the other benchmarks, we're going through seven zip here. The 7700 is coming quite close in this benchmark. And then moving over to Geekbench 5, the 13600K does score quite a sizable victory here. Then moving on to C1.3, the 13600K does spread its wings again. And the same is said for V-Ray as well as Premiere Pro. So basically when it comes to the productivity side of things, Intel do have an advantage there with their i5 13600K. Having ultimately more cores and more threads available does help with those productivity numbers. Though the final feature with both these CPUs that we we're just talking about here is the iGPU. The 7700, the Ryzen 7, does come with an iGPU, but it's much less functional than the 13600Ks, where, for instance, in Premiere Pro, you can take advantage of that iGPU, enable quick sync, and extract more performance out of the 13600K. As opposed to the 7700, it really is, as AMD stated, just a backup display to get things running. And perhaps you wanna run an x86 server, and you only need a display out for the functionality purposes, then you can do so without having to use a separate GPU. So the i5-13600K's iGPU does have more utility at this point in time, but with all that aside, let's move over now to a conclusion. So with all the numbers out of the way, I believe the Ryzen 7 7700 is a hidden gem from AMD. I would much prefer this over the 7700X, for example, which doesn't come with a cooler, costs more money, and has a poor out of the box experience in my opinion, and that's clocked too high, it uses too much power. This thing comes with a perfect profile out of the box, which undervolting it, you're not gonna gain a whole lot of benefits by doing so, which is actually a good thing to say. It means that AMD's checked out the efficiency out of the box and made this so it's coming in at a good sweet spot that anyone can really enjoy. And the reason I also like having my CPU running cooler is perhaps if I come into a problem in the future, whether I'm editing a video or something, and the program crashes, at least I'm gonna know in the back of my head, hey, that wasn't because my CPU was running too hot. Also, in this day and age, getting a box cooler for me personally just enhances that experience, especially the Wraith Prism, which in my opinion is easily the best included box cooler on any CPU that's been released to date. I really like the look of this thing, I like the noise, I like the cooling performance, and the fact that it comes with the 7700 is a real big bonus. Though the final icing on the cake with this whole setup here 
is you've got the cheap memory that you can couple with it, the cheap motherboard, and it's gonna do a great job without missing out on a whole lot of FPS. Even versus someone who goes out and gets that really expensive X670 motherboard, they get that 6,000 megahertz memory, they get the water cooler, they're not really gonna be getting a whole lot more, especially in terms of value for money, they're actually gonna be missing out on a lot as opposed to going with this budget setup. And I know people say, well, the upgradability. Well, if you look at the 7700 and how power efficient it is, it'd be safe to assume that in the future, there'll be much better power efficient CPUs coming out from AMD. So you'll also have a very good upgrade path in that relation, even if you get a B650. Though the final question that may be on your mind is the Ryzen 7 7700 versus the i5-13600K, which would I go with personally? And that really depends. If I wasn't doing YouTube videos and I was just a gamer, I'd actually go for the Ryzen 7 7700. However, if I was creating videos, which I do now, I would go for the 13600K. So basically, if you've got a bigger productivity focus, 13600K is gonna be better on that front. If you're mainly gaming, I think the Ryzen 7 7700 is gonna be a better experience. Anyhow guys, with all that aside, I hope you enjoyed today's review of the Ryzen 7 7700. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button for us and also let us know in the comment section below what you think of this CPU, especially coupled with the B650 and the 4800 megahertz memory. Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always. Just like this question of the day here, which comes from mum's ID. So he's using his mum's ID and it looks like he's got a busted Ryzen CPU. So he says here, I bought a Ryzen 9 and it came with damaged pins, like 30 bent pins, and one pin is completely busted off. I've been trying to straighten them, but I'm losing hope. Any tips? So I've bent back a heap of Ryzen pins in the past. As long as they're not completely slammed down, they're usually pretty easy to get back. You do need the right tool, however, which is why in that video, I use a very fine uh, screwdriver, and I've actually bent so many pins back. I've actually never, failed in uh, bending pins back and having the CPU work on any Ryzen CPUs. So do take your time and do look at it very carefully on two different angles to make sure that pin is facing upright and do make sure they, uh, basically the CPU should slot in fairly easy. If it isn't, that means some of the pins are still bent and you need to straighten them out. But in terms of losing uh, pins completely off the CPU, I've actually believe in the past, I've had a CPU that's lost maybe six pins and it still worked perfectly fine. So just because there's one pin bent off, could be a crucial pin, but usually it's a pin that does have at least one redundancy. So your hopes are pretty good. Just keep on with it. Hope that answers that question. And if you guys have stayed this far and you're enjoying that Tech Yes content, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell to get the videos as soon as they drop. And I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.